Good day. In my last programme, I discussed two topics which I propose to return to in this video. The first is the situation in Kherson region, where I think we're starting to get some indications about what Russian intentions are. If you recall, in my last video, I discussed the possibility that Russia might either be planning to withdraw from Kherson region or might be preparing to stay and make a fight in Kherson region and that this talk of Russia withdrawing from Kherson region was wrong. I said that I leaned to the view that the Russians were intending to make a fight in Kherson region and that they were not withdrawing from Kherson region and today I'm going to say straight away that that opinion has been strengthened. I think it's becoming increasingly unlikely that the Russians are going to pull out of Kherson region anytime soon, if at all. So that's the first thing I wanted to say. The, se <coughs> the second topic that I'm going to discuss is the topic of the dirty bomb, which is now taking on much more of a momentum than I expected that it would when I made my video yesterday. And I'm going to say that there's a lot more information now pouring out and some of it is starting to look rather concerning. But let's first of all talk about Herson region. Let me first of all clarify what I see as the situation in Herson region. Now, before doing so, I'm just going to go reel back in time to the early part of September when Ukraine was launching its Kharkov counter-offensive and I think I was the first person to float the possibility, though it was not a prediction, but just a discussion of a possibility that the Russians might be m preparing to withdraw from Izium, abandon Izium, rather than let their troops be surrounded there. Now, I, I came to the view that that was possible essentially for one overriding reason. When Ukraine started its offensive in Kharkov region, at the time of the initial fighting in the town of Balaklia, and for a couple of days after that, it became very obvious to me very quickly that Ukraine was not fighting to any significant extent the Russian regular army. There didn't seem to be any Re Russian regular army troops deployed in Balaklia itself. Balaklia was de defended by members of the Lugansk militia, backed by um, troops, if you like, of Russia's Roskvadia organization, which is an internal security organization. It is not a part of the, of the Russian regular army. And subsequently, some airborne troops were deployed to Balaklia. And I thought for a time that these had come to reinforce the Roskvadia troops who were trying to defend the, the town. But it subsequently turned out that they'd been sent in not to reinforce these troops, but to make it possible to pull them out, to pull them back. And Russian airborne troops were also deployed hurriedly in one or two other places, also to block Ukrainian advances. But as it turned out, this too was a covering maneuver in order to provide time for the Russian regular military to pull out of Kharkov region. So it was clear that there was no real fighting going on on any significant extent between Russian regular army formations, tank and mechanised infantry, t men in tanks and infantry fighting vehicles and that sort of thing, and the Ukrainian forces. As I put it in a subsequent video, the Ukrainian offensive in Kharkiv region was 
essentially punched air. They were they 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 hit at a place that the Russians were clearly, to a great extent, already pulling out of. And subsequently, we got an awful lot more information about the actual extent of Russian deployments in this part of Kharkov region, and it turned out that regular Russian army troops stationed in Izium might have numbered fewer than a thousand men as against the 9,000 that Ukraine was throwing into the battle. So it was clear that the Russians were pulling out and that they weren't really defending in that area. And that was what made me decide as it became increasingly clear that the Russian army wasn't seriously defending itself in that part of Kharkov region. It was this that made me think that the Russians might decide to just pull out, which is, of course, exactly what they did. Now, the fundamental difference between that situation and the situation in Kherson region, what has made me question almost from the outset the entire theory that the Russians are planning a major pullback from Kherson region is that in contrast to what happened in Kharkov region, the Russian army is very, very much there on the ground, in on the front lines, um, actively defending its positions, repelling Ukrainian attacks, inflicting heavy casualties on the Ukrainian army when it carries out attacks. In other words, it's a completely different situation. And I would have expected that if there was a Russian retreat from Kherson region, we would be seeing by now some evidence of a gradual, perhaps systematic withdrawal of Russian forces from their front lines. In fact, on the contrary, since ever since Ukraine made its uh, abort, its its breakthrough um, in early October and sent an armoured column which was then stopped by the Russians at the village of Duchani on the west bank of the Dnieper River. Ever since then, um, the front lines have been in Kherson region have been stable. There's no sign that the Russians have been withdrawing troops from this sort of perimeter which they've established, which is, by the way, tens of kilometers away from Kherson city. There's no sign that they've been pulling back from that perimeter. And on the contrary, whenever Ukraine attacks, the troops, the Russian troops at that perimeter um, have been giving a very good account of themselves. So that already, to my mind, calls into question the entire theory of a Russian pullback. Now, <clears throat> it is the case that the Russians have withdrawn civilians, are withdrawing civilians, pulling out civilians from Kherson city. But as I've discussed in previous videos, this is something that the Russians have done in other places. When a particular town is likely to be subjected to heavy shelling by um, Ukraine. So right at the outset of this war, back in February, indeed before Russia formally began its special military operation, already there was a mass evacuation of civilians from Donetsk city and Lugansk city, not so different from what we're seeing at the moment happening in Kherson region and from Kherson city. And of course, at that time, there was never any question that Donetsk city and Lugansk city were going to be defended. So that seems to me more consistent with, that seems to me more consistent with what we're seeing in Kherson region at the moment. There's also 
something else, however, that's been happening and which has become increasingly clear. I talked about the big Russian pontoon bridges that have been constructed. Um, some people in um, the Western media, indeed also Ukrainian channels, indeed one Russian channel, was suggesting that the Russians were pulling their forces from the west bank of the Dnieper back to the east bank across these bridges. But I think this was already looking difficult to believe in light of commentaries like the one I discussed from the former spokesman of the Ukrainian general staff, who appeared to be suggesting that on the contrary, the Russians were reinforcing, not pulling back. And I think over the last couple of hours, it seems increasingly likely that that is indeed exactly what has been going on. That the Russian forces in Kherson region have been undergoing a rotation. The light airborne infantry paratroopers who have been holding the front lines until fairly recently, until the last couple of days in fact, and who've been fighting and repelling Ukrainian attacks basically since the start of the Ukrainian offensive in Kharkiv region at the end of August. It looks like they and the Chechen militia troops who were deployed to this area um, a few weeks ago, it looks as if they are being pulled back, but that they are being replaced by regular Russian army units. Um, that's to say, people with tanks and um, self-propelled guns and armoured vehicles and that sort of thing. And that makes complete sense. It makes complete sense because obviously these light infantry, airborne light infantry, have been fighting now for many weeks and it's likely that they're getting very tired and that they need to be taken out of the front lines so that they can rest and uh, recover. But it also makes sense because it's clear that defending Kherson region has absorbed a disproportionate share of Russia's reserve of airborne troops, paratroopers. And these are perhaps the best infantry that Russia has. And the Russians typically like to use their paratroopers in an offensive way, uh, seizing places behind the enemy's front lines, like that attack on Gostomel Airport near Kiev, which the Russian paratroopers carried out at the start of the war. And also, of course, they, uh, they used, the Russian military likes to use them as a kind of fire brigade, so when there's a problem in one particular area of the battlefronts, they quickly deploy, they're able to quickly deploy these lightly equipped but very highly trained and professional airborne troops to the crisis point where they can stabilize the situation until troops with heavier <laughs> heavier troops regular troops with tanks and armored vehicles are able to move in and we saw them doing precisely that um, at the beginning of september in Kharkov region when they extracted the Roskvadia troops from Balaklia, for example. Keeping your paratroopers bogged down on the front line, um, using up these precious infantry is probably not something that the Russian command would want to do. I suspect that the decision was taken to deploy the bulk of Russia's airborne infantry to defend Kherson region back in August when the airwaves were full of talk, or perhaps even July, when the airwaves were full of talk about Ukraine's pending Kherson counteroffensive. And of course the Russians, as we now know, were running short of regular infantry because 
so many of their contract soldiers were uh, withdrawing from the regular army at, on the expiry of their contracts, which was starting to take place in August. So the Russians needed to find troops to close the gap in Kherson region. And they called up their airborne troops to do it. And for more than a month now, in fact, for two months, the airborne troops have done this extremely effectively, but as I said, at some cost to themselves, no doubt. And besides, this isn't perhaps the most efficient use of these sort of troops. Now, as Russian regular force formations are being rebuilt with reservists and that sort of thing, these 300,000 troops that are being called up, um, as more of these reservists become available, it's become easier. It's, it's now becoming possible, rather, to transfer heavier, regular infantry across the pontoon bridges into Kherson region, where they're starting to replace these paratroopers and those largely lightly armed Chechen troops. And I think that is probably what's been going on. And what has happened is that some people have confused this rotation with a general retreat. Something like that, by the way, happens regularly um, in Bakhmut City. Ukraine is, as we know, defending Bakhmut City in Donetsk region. It's in fact the linchpin of their defense lines. Every so often, they pull out a unit, a brigade that's been very badly um, damaged in the fighting, with many of the men killed or wounded, with much of the um, equipment destroyed. They pull it back so that they can rebuild it in the rear. And this is sometimes reported as a withdrawal from Bakhmut City. In fact, I've mentioned some of those reports about with Ukrainian withdrawals from Bakhmut City in earlier videos. What has happened is that even as the Ukrainians pull one battered brigade back, they replace it with a newer, fresher brigade which is able to continue the fight. And I think this is exactly what we've seen in Kherson region. Now, why do I say, say that? Firstly, because as I said, there's no sign of any pullback from the front lines. But now we've had a very interesting report from the ground that the Russians are taking the further step of setting up a territorial militia with the obvious purpose of defending Kherson city itself and the surrounding localities. Now, this will presumably be made up of men, young men, from um, the city itself, people who are seen as political, politically reliable. They will not, I think, be deployed on the front lines. I mean, they don't belong there but they will be able to perform internal security roles within Kherson city and the surrounding localities, freeing Russian troops to actually continue the battle on the front lines. And it's clear that an internal security force of that nature is needed because another piece of news that we've been getting out of Kherson city over the last couple of hours is that there is apparently a major operation being carried out by the Russian security services to identify and round up um, Ukrainian um, agents operating in Kherson city itself and in the surrounding area. There was even reports of some gunfights taking place and there is a sort of dragnet operation underway now that most of the civilians have either left or are leaving it's become easier to identify who these operatives or agents are 
And as I said, the Russians seem to be intending to round them all up. And again, that points to my mind to a decision to stay rather than to leave. So it's still not completely clear exactly what's going on. But as I said, it seems to me that the evidence is starting to tilt towards a Russian decision to stand firm in Kherson and to continue to repel Ukrainian defences, uh, uh, offences there. There's one other thing which has happened, which um, to my mind also points in the same direction. And that relates to a decision that the Russians took, I think two days ago, which was to start releasing water, more water, through the Novaya Kakhovka dam. Now, over the last couple of days, the Russians have been ringing alarm bells that Ukraine was planning some sort of attempt to burst the dam, to destroy the locks, to use... Now, I, I think there's already increasing numbers of reports use submarine drones to destroy the locks. Um, and the, the idea was apparently for Ukraine to not just flood the area, but perhaps more practically, to create a surge of water, a kind of tidal surge, which would no doubt either sweep away or inflict serious damage on these Russian pontoon bridges, which have become so important for the Russian effort in Kherson region. And this has clearly caused a great deal of alarm. So what the Russians are doing is that they're gradually allowing water to flow through the dam, increase the amount of water that's flowing through the dam, allowing the water level of the Dnieper to rise so that if the dam is breached, there will be less of a surge, leaving the pontoon bridges intact. Now, if that's the plan, um, then that, and that seems to me the only explanation for this decision, then that makes logical sense, but it also means that the Russians need those pontoon bridges, which also suggests that they're intending to stand and make a fight of it in the Kherson region. So I don't think it's conclusive. I don't, I'm not suggesting at the moment that we can definitely say that there's been no Russian decision to pull back from Kherson region, but it looks to me as if the accumulation of evidence is now clearly pointing to the Russians choosing to stay and in fact to reinforce. Now, just a few things to add here. Uh, there's been an internet blackout in Kherson city, and there's been much speculation about why that is. Um, it's been suggested that this is all part of um, an attempt by the Russians to conceal the withdrawal of their forces through Kherson city, but presumably Ukraine, through its satellite information that it's been getting from the Western powers would be aware of a organized, a large withdrawal of that nature. Um, I think it's more likely that the internet blackout and probably the communications blackout is part of this dragnet operation that I've been talking about. As the Russians have decided to stand and fight, they are apparently resolved to close down whatever in Ukrainian intelligence gathering or potentially sabotage operation might still be functioning in Kherson city. And so as they want to close this, this, these intelligence operation down, they're taking steps to cut off communications, to isolate these operatives, the easier, presumably, to try to track them down. So I suspect that's what that is all about. And I'm also going to say that there's one other thing that points to a Russian decision to stand firm, 
And that's this continued deluge of reports that we're getting from the deputy, the Russian appointed deputy governor of the region, uh, a person called Kirill Stramusov, who seems to be the major spokesman of the Kherson, the Russian appointed Kherson regional government. He seems a much more active or visible figure than the actual governor, Mr. Saltko. Anyway, whatever. Kirill Stramusov continues to talk about the fact that all Ukrainian attacks um, along the front lines have been repelled. And I have to say, up to now, whenever he's made that claim, it's turned out to be largely true. So, you know, let's not discount the fact that he's uh, uh, discount the man's reliability simply because he talks rather a lot, given that whenever he said these things previously, he's turned he's large turned out to be largely right but anyway he still he still gives the impression that there's no intention of abandoning Kherson city and that he's even said that in these ineffectual attacks that ukraine has been carrying out in and around Kherson region ukraine is losing around 200 men killed every day that's his estimate. I, I think it may be about right, by the way. But I want to stress it's his estimate. It's not mine. Now, again, it seems to me that Stramusov's many comments again point to a Russian decision to stand and fight. So, though, as I said, I don't think it's conclusive yet. It increasingly looks to me as if that is the Russian plan. Now... Since I've mentioned Stramusov's claim about um, Ukrainian losses in Kherson region, daily losses in Kherson region, I'm going to say something about certain reports I've seen floating around the internet, the Russian parts of the internet, uh, which have been giving what I think have been impossibly high estimates of Russian of Ukrainian losses. One estimate was 200,000 killed. Another was 400,000 killed. Now, I'm going to say this. Um, I think Ukraine has suffered very heavy losses over the course of this war. But I think that those figures are wildly exaggerated. Back in the middle of September, <clears throat> the Russian defense minister, Sergei Shoigu, uh, put the Russian regular military's losses at 6,000 men killed and said that Ukraine had suffered permanent losses of 110,000, including both killed and wounded. And from memory, I think he's, um, the figure that he gave for killed was just over 60,000 and for wounded, a little, a little more than that. Uh, 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 rather less than that, around 39,000. That These are figures I'm taking from memory. Now, obviously, it's clear from reading um, uh, Shoigu's words that he was talking only about the regular military. He was not talking about many of these militia organisations that Ukraine has cobbled together. And it's highly likely that Ukrainian losses have increased since then. In fact, it's certain that they have. And perhaps, given that Ukraine has been trying to conduct an offensive since the end of August, that the rate of losses that Ukraine is suffering has now probably increased significantly. But I can't square those figures that Shoigu gave with these figures of 200,000 to 400,000 killed that I've been seeing on the internet. I don't understand the methodology. It doesn't make any kind of sense to me. I go to stick with Shoigu's figures for the time being. Now, I would say, I would repeat again, that undoubtedly Ukrainian losses, the rate of losses has been increasing given that Ukraine has been taking the offensive. Shoigu said, again in that interview, that Ukraine had lost, uh, suffered losses of around 7,000 killed in the first three weeks of September. 
as a result of those offensives. And again, of course, he was talking about regular army. And I've seen some reports, which may be true, that in fact the total losses that Ukraine suffered over the course of September may have numbered as high as 20,000. Of course, if losses were maintained at that level throughout the war, then Ukraine would indeed have suffered losses, well, which would be greater even than these internet reports are alleging. But I don't, but that's obviously not the case. Ukraine has been on the defensive most of the time. And I think we mustn't fall into the trap of believing these clearly inflated claims, which to my mind look like disinformation. Anyway, that brings me now to the other subject, which is the dirty bomb story. Now, yesterday I expressed my deep scepticism. I'm going to say straightforwardly overnight, as I've begun to piece everything together, that scepticism has somewhat diminished, though I still think that a dirty bomb incident is unlikely. But anyway, let's let's look at the reconstruction of events, because it is interesting, and it goes back further than I realized and it does suggest some rather interesting possibilities now this whole thing started in my opinion with that interview that general surovikin gave about 10 days ago about a week just over a week ago in which surovikin said amongst many other things that he said that there was um evidence that ukraine was preparing to, to take to you to undertake to conduct its war using prohibited methods now at the time i thought that surovikin was probably referring to the attempts to breach ukrainian attempts to breach the novaya kakhovka dam but i have to say i'm not sure that those attacks on the novaya kakhovka dam would be prohibited methods and they don't seem that different from the attacks on civilian infrastructures ukrainian civilian infrastructure that ukraine itself is that russia itself has been conducting so <laughs> what was surovikin referring to well i have to say it seems to me clear that what he was talking about was this suggestion that ukraine is considering using a dirty bomb. Now, consider what's happened over the last week, 10 days or so. We had Surovikin's interview. We then had that extraordinary and so far unexplained trip by the British Defence Secretary Ben Wallace to Washington DC to meet and have a discussion face to face with US Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. That's a very strange and mysterious trip. No real explanation for it has been given. Wallace has said that he needed to speak directly to Austin because there was information that British communications, British American communications had been compromised, which I found an extraordinary thing for a British Defence Secretary to say. As I have said, even if that were true, and that would be an astonishing revelation, by the way, but even if that were true, I, I, I am incredulous that a British Defence Secretary would publicly disclose the fact that there'd been a security breach of that nature. But anyway, Wallace made the dash to Washington. Shortly after he meets Austin, Austin telephones the Russian Defence Minister, Sergei Shoigu, and it's clear that it was Austin who took the initiative to make the call. The nature of the discussion between Shoigu and Austin is very unclear, though the two men did agree to maintain contacts. Then, 
we got further reports that Shoigu yesterday went on an extraordinary round of calls. He called the Turkish defence minister, he called the French defence minister, he called the British defence minister. He actually spoke on the telephone to Ben Wallace himself. And this after Wallace and Shoigu exchanged what appears to have been a very polite exchange of letters discussing that incident over the Black Sea when a Suhoi fighter jet, a Russian Suhoi fighter jet, launched a missile in proximity to a British surveillance aircraft and Shoigu reassured Wallace that this was all the result of a technical breakdown. So they've already been in touch, they've already been corresponding, but Shoigu now telephoned Wallace. And it turns out that all of these calls were to discuss the dirty bomb. This claim that Ukraine is engaging in producing a dirty bomb. And over the course of today, we've had a flood of claims from Russian officials about Ukraine being on the way to producing a dirty bomb. And we've also, by the way, had reminders of some of the rather reckless things that President Zelensky has said at various times about nuclear weapons, dirty bombs, and those sort of things, including that rather maladroit interview he gave a short while ago to, I think, Australian media, in which he said that um, the Western powers ought to consider preemptive strikes against Russia in, in the event that there was a real risk of uh, the Russians using tactical nuclear weapons. Something which, as I said many times, the Russians have completely excluded. They have said they have no intention of using tactical nuclear weapons in Ukraine and that this isn't part of their agenda at all. So, what, what more can one say? First of all, the Russian intelligence service has said that they've picked up information about an instruction from Zelensky's government to Ukrainian nuclear scientists to put together a dirty bomb. And there's no doubt at all that if you're talking about the industrial facilities and the scientific knowledge, the materials and the scientists to create such a dirty bomb do exist in Ukraine. But of course, it's important always to emphasize that a capability does not translate into an intention. Ukraine may have the means to put such a horrible device together. It doesn't follow that it intends to use it or to, to, to use it. So always one should separate the one from the other. But I wonder whether the Russians haven't convinced themselves or been convinced that Ukraine does indeed intend to use some kind of dirty bomb device and whether that perhaps is what explains the evacuation from Kherson region more than anything else. I, if one makes the massive assumption, and I stress it's only an assumption, and it's one I'm still skeptical about, but if one makes the massive assumption that Ukraine is planning some sort of use of such a device um, over the course of this war with the intention of blaming it on the Russians, well, Kherson region might be the logical place to do it. It's open steppe land, so there would be quite a lot of damage. It's not very thickly populated, but it, and it's an area where the Ukrainians are very keen to push the Russians out. So it might be that that is what has caused all this alarm. It might have been that that was what triggered that decision to evacuate the civilians from Kherson city as quickly as possible because of fears that Ukraine might be planning to use such a device. Consider something else. Kherson region adjoins Zaporozhye. 
region. And of course, Zaporozhye region is where the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant is located. I've already discussed in my previous video how one of my more erudite correspondents who follows me, uh, who follows, who watches these videos, pointed out that if the dam were, were indeed breached, the Novaya Kakhovka dam were indeed breached, that might reduce water levels in the Kakhovka reservoir. Uh, the water from that reservoir being used as coolant for the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant. And of course, Ukraine has been shelling that nuclear power plant, which in, in, in and of itself has the potential to create a dangerous incident. In fact, there's been a lot of wild talk about this. So, given that Ukraine has been shelling the nuclear power plant, perhaps in a way, a kind of indirect way, if you like, of creating a ecological disaster comparable to what you'd get from a dirty bomb. Perhaps if Ukraine has given up hoping that it can do it that way, well, some Russians might think that it might be planning to do it some other way by actually creating such a device. Now, I want to stress again, I'm not convinced that the Ukrainians have any such plans. I think that Ukraine, I hope and believe that Ukraine knows that if it did deploy a dirty bomb and use it in that kind of fashion, certainly the Western powers would know. And even if Western governments wanted to provide cover for Ukraine, Western militaries would, I have absolutely no doubt, be utterly shocked by such a move and there would be intense internal pressure within Western governments to start dialing down support for Ukraine given what a reckless regime that would then visibly appear to be. I say that because I have no doubt that Western militaries, the British, French and American militaries would see use of a dirty bomb as a, as a lowering of the nuclear threshold, a dangerous lowering of the nuclear threshold, and would strongly oppose such a move if it were done by Ukraine. So I think that Ukraine probably knows that. I, I'm, I assume that they know that. And that's one reason why I doubt that they would take the incredibly dangerous and reckless step of, of, of making such a move. But of course, <laughs> putting all these facts together and perhaps picking up some radio chatter, things that Ukrainian officials may be saying to each other, people say lots of things to each other, people talk about things which they don't actually mean to do. Um, I remember back in 2013, in the Syrian conflict, the US apparently placed a huge amount of reliance on some radio chatter between a number of Syrian officials, and that they made that made them think that a certain type of attack was being prepared. And actually, I don't think it did, but it's un you, one could just about see how some people in the US might have imagined that it was, or, or spun it in a way to make it seem like it was. And I wonder whether something similar might not have happened. And obviously that would ring alarm bells in Moscow. And the Russians, who undoubtedly do maintain some levels of contacts, especially at the level of intelligence officers with the Western powers, would have probably circulated some of that intelligence to the Western powers. And that might have been some extremely alarming to the Western powers. And that might have been what triggered Wallace's dash to Washington and his desire to speak with Lloyd Austin. Might have been, it may be that Wallace was not so much worried about the Russians listening in on his calls, but on people 
too friendly to Ukraine within the British government listening in on his calls, which is why he might have wanted to go and speak to Austin. And that might have caused Austin to call Shoigu and to ask for more information about this. And that may be what has caused Shoigu to call a to call all these Western officials, all these Western defence ministers and the Turkish defence in minister and to provide more information. Now, officially, Western governments are, of course, rejecting this theory. They're poo-pooing any suggestion that Ukraine is really planning to use a dirty bomb. Um, it is inconceivable that at a time like this, when Ukraine has not used such a bomb, and when Western governments have invested so much in supporting Ukraine, that they would come out and say, yeah, the Russians are absolutely right. Ukraine is indeed planning to use a dirty bomb. Um, I mean, that's not going to happen at this time. But I'm going to make a guess that over the last couple of hours and days the telephone lines to Kiev have been buzzing and Western officials have indeed been telling the Ukrainians if you have any plans if you have had any thoughts to do something like this then don't do it don't go there it's not going to work out well for you if you do uh, all all it will do is it will shift opinion in the West amongst Western militaries, who are already, I suspect, pretty skeptical of this adventure. It will shift opinion against you amongst the militaries even further. And it also risks an escalation with the Russians, which we do not want. And by the way, on that topic, it's interesting that the US government has again apparently categorically rejected Ukrainian demands for the supply of Atakam's um, medium-range missiles, such as can be launched from high Mars launchers. And apparently, the US has told Ukraine that one reason why they are not providing these Atakam's missiles is because they think that Ukraine might use them against Crimea not just against those parts of Russia, which the US recognizes as Russian, but against Crimea as well, which points to serious concern on the part of the US military about the potential for escalation if this thing isn't kept under some kind of control. So I think this is probably what's happening. I have to say that I think this dirty bomb thing, there's a big story here, and I'm only, I think, scratching the surface. I suspect there's an awful lot more going on than I know, that anybody outside the defence intelligence establishments of the various powers knows. And it could be, as I said, that the Russians have gone down a rabbit hole and are misunderstanding intelligence that they're getting. Uh, but for what it's worth, I'm starting to think that they at least believe that this thing is real. And I think that Western governments are sufficiently concerned, either because of what they're worried that Ukraine might conceivably be thinking of doing, or might be doing, or perhaps about what the Russians might be doing um, in response to this perceived threat that they're taking counter uh, that they're taking action of their own anyway this is an evolving story but for what it's worth i do think that these events in herson region and this dirty bomb story are connected in some way i strongly suspect that the russians do believe that the that her, Ukraine was planning 
some kind of incident of that nature, either with the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant or perhaps with a dirty bomb, and that the de decision to evacuate civilians from Kherson and those areas is probably connected to this in some way. That's my belief. Stress again, it's not a fact. So, I don't know how much further this story is going to go. I suspect that whatever crisis there may have been, if there was a crisis, has probably now been averted through diplomatic action. But of course, this is an evolving story. The conflict in Ukraine is nothing if not unpredictable and we'll just have to wait and see how things turn out. Anyway, that's me for the debt today. Um, lots more to discuss. Interesting story from Reuters, which appears to confirm, for example, that Western governments have quietly given up any hope that their oil price cap idea is going to seriously affect the Russians or Russia's ability to sell oil. But I'm going to discuss that in future videos. And in the meantime, all that remains is for me to wish you a very good day and to promise to be back soon. And just to remind you again, you can find all my videos and Duran videos on our various other platforms, Locals, Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, and of course now Rofkin, where we're also on Rofkin. And you can support us via Patreon and Subscribestar. Links under this video. And last but not least, please uh, remember that you can buy all sorts of great things from our shop, our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, our sweatshirts, and all the rest. And that if you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. Well, that's me for the day. More from me soon. Music